liberate me from my own noise and my own chaos, from the chains of a lesser law, you said me. silence of the heart you speak in the silence of the heart you speak and it is there that I will know you and you will know me in the silence of the heart you speak you speak in the silence of the heart Satisfy me till I am quiet and confident in the work of the Spirit. I cannot see you satisfy me till I am quiet. silence of the heart you speak in the silence of the heart you speak and it is there that I will know you and you will know me in the silence of the heart you speak you speak the silence of the heart the silence of the heart silence of the heart good morning and welcome to first christian church a community of god's love and hospitality whatever brings you to this time whether you're joining us in person or online know that we believe god loves you and you are welcome in this space a few words about our worship this morning before we move deeper into this space one, in a few moments, we will offer prayers. Prayers for those we know and love, prayers for this wider world. There are green prayer cards near the entryway. Those joining us via Facebook Live, certainly post your comments there and we'll try to incorporate your prayers in our prayer life. As I say every week, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, reach out to us during the week and we'll make sure to incorporate your prayers in our weekly email and our prayer life. Uh, Nellie is available for children who need to take advantage of the children's ministry. Chandra is available for the nursery if somebody wants to head to the nursery at any point. But, but know that all sounds, all age levels, all energy is welcome in this space. Um, so we give thanks for that. Mis <laughs> Misan is away uh, for a Disciples Women's Conference in Fort Worth, Texas. And so we hold her in thought and prayer and she'll be reaching out to our parents of youth about upcoming activities. Also, you will find candles in the back and the front of the sanctuary to light if you find that a meaningful part of your prayer life. Certainly do that after worship or during the music or times of silence. Also, for those joining us online, let us know where you're joining us from this morning. Whether that's here in the sanctuary or Lawton, Oklahoma, or somewhere around the world, it reminds us that God's love unites us in this space of welcome and hospitality and the virtual world. Also, we will be breaking bread later in the service. There are multiple ways to do that. Certainly those who are online, grab whatever communion elements are meaningful to you. We do have bread and juice up here, but if that doesn't feel safe due to illness, we have the all-in-one communion cups, and we also now have a gluten-free option. So no matter how you experience communion, whatever that means to you, know that you are welcome in that space. 
Finally, in that spirit of welcome and hospitality, I invite you to stand as you are able and join together in song. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. I will follow you. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. Well, I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight, high above my life. Well, I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. To the world, light into my life. Well, I will live for you alone. You're the one I seek, knowing I will find. Well, all I need in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. Serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. Well, I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you.
We're standing on holy ground For the Lord is present And where God is, is holy And this is holy ground We're standing on holy ground For the Lord is present As I explained earlier in the service, there are multiple ways to offer prayers or share those prayers. We have green prayer cards near the entryway. You can post them on Facebook Live. You can let us know after the service. There are also candles in the front and the back of the sanctuary to light during the song, during the songs and following worship. But before I begin to share the prayers, a few words about this time. I will share a prayer from this congregation and then say the phrase, God in your mercy. I invite you to respond with the simple phrase, hear our prayer. But before we enter that time of sharing, I invite you to get comfortable in your seats and follow me in a simple contemplative breathing exercise. Let us begin this time of prayer by breathing in God's gift of peace. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let us continue by breathing in God's gift of hope. Breathing in. Breathing out. Finally, let us breathe in God's gift of love. Breathing in and breathing out. We continue by giving thanks for this community of faith that continues to commit itself to God's hospitality and love. And in that spirit, we give thanks for all of our partners and collaborators in ministry. Home Again LA, Burbank Temporary Aid Center, Homemade Thursdays, Project Mercy, Burbank Armenian Association, Green Chalice, Burbank Pride, week of compassion and so many others but today we also give thanks for the volunteers who traveled down to Tijuana this yes just yesterday for a home build and we give thanks for Melba and her children who will now live in the home that was built for the ways in which she teaches us perseverance strength and commitment and so we give thanks for our partners in ministry God in your mercy we have a special prayer request also from Carolyn Purser, who recently has been cut back in terms of her hours and employment in her situation. And with that, that would, hap that would cause crisis in any community, but especially in LA where housing costs and food costs are astronomical. So Carolyn, we hold you in thought and prayer and we continue to stand with you. God in your mercy. Also, you might be hearing new sounds this morning in the sanctuary for which we give deep thanks, which is a reminder that we continue to pray for and with Ben, Andy, and the new 14-month-old they welcomed into their family recently. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for Sarah, Todd, and Caden Hopmeyer as Sarah and Todd welcomed a new infant into their lives. God, in your mercy. We continue to pray for those in our community of faith who face some kind of medical uncertainty or are recovering from surgery or have some health issue in their lives. For Brian and Nancy, for Janine, for Janet, Diane, Gina and Forrest and Pam. God in your mercy. We also continue to pray for Deborah Baird's mother as she faces a life transition. We pray for Deborah as well. God in your mercy. We pray for those in our community and around the world who are striking, demonstrating, or working on better compensation in their places of employment. We pray for unions and those who support them. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for just and lasting peace with a reminder of the headlines that stalk us every day. 
We pray for those who are most vulnerable in our global communities, those who don't have access to water, to electricity, to gas, to the basic sustenance they need in this world. We pray for Palestine. We pray for Israeli leaders. We also pray for Armenia, the Ukraine, Darfur, and so many others around this world. God, in your mercy. Every week, we also pray for the increase in rhetoric around hate, racism, sexism, homophobia, and all of the isms that plague our society. We pray for those who are victims. We pray for those communities who are most vulnerable. We pray for the courage to embody love and hope in this world. God, in your mercy. We also have a continued prayer request for those struggling with addiction in its many forms, those who stand with and care for those individuals. God, in your mercy. And as we pray every week, we pray for those experiencing homelessness, those who are most vulnerable, those who stand with them and seek to care for them. God, in your mercy. And then we turn our attention back to this community of faith. May we continue to pray that we will be people of hope, new life, justice, and love in this world. Somebody agrees. God, in your mercy. Let us continue this time of prayer and song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way Precious Lord, linger near when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. time of prayer. God of our ancestors, God of those who teach us, inspire us, challenge us, disappoint us, God of imperfect realities and complex histories. We come to you this day fully aware of the circumstances that swirl around our lives, a world that is unpredictable, chaotic, unjust, and violent and heartbreaking. God, but we also come to you with remarkable reminders of new life, of childhood laughter, 
of family, of supportive communities, of people striving to be a presence of love in this world. And so with those two circumstances, both the heartbreaking and the hope-filled, we gather this morning to simply be reminded of your consistent and loving presence in our lives and this world. For you have heard our prayers this morning, prayers for health and healing, prayers for employment and unemployment, prayers for peace and prayers for uncertainty. Prayers for a community striving to be a presence of love in this world. We simply ask that you surround our prayers in the same gifts of hope, peace, and love that we breathed in this morning. And as we breathe out during this time of prayer, continue to strengthen and empower us to simply walk in our lives. Where there's imperfection, help us to embrace hope. Where there is in chaos, help us to lean on your peace. Where there is injustice, help us to create love and equity. We ask all of these in the mystery of your sacred name, which embraces each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Our reading today comes from Ruth. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 18. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two two daughters-in-law, and they went their way on their way back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughter, two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. She kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. So she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of Ruth, God of Naomi, open us this day to an ancient story, the story of our ancestors. In your name we pray, amen. I have a problem with the story of Ruth and Naomi, she said to me, looking at me straight 
in my eyes. I've always had a problem with it. You see, after seminary, I decided it would be helpful if when I engaged in Bible studies that I would gather a group of lay people together and simply listen to their responses to these stories. I'd been surrounded by some of the most incredible biblical scholars, theologians, ethicists, but for a couple of years I'd been withdrawn from some of that kind of local church ministry and environment, and so in my optimism and my willingness during one of the first churches I served, I gathered a group of women together and decided to embark on the study of she rose in the Bible. And I would simply listen. I would bite my tongue. I would hold back certain things and listen as they interpreted the stories that we set before us. It's a good lesson for a 20-something-year-old guy. And so we opened the story of Ruth and Naomi, which is phenomenal in its complexity and its narrative. You find it in the writings of the Hebrew Bible. It's not included in the history books. It's not included in the book of, of prophets or some of those other categories or even the Torah itself, but it's in this unique category of writings, much like Job, the Psalms, and Proverbs. It rises to the level of mystery sacred text because those who put the Hebrew Bible together believed in the power and mythical and transforming significance of this story. I have a problem with the story of Ruth and Naomi. That 70 year old woman said that afternoon. I said, tell me more. Ruth seemed to lose all of her identity when she hitched her wagon to Naomi. Tell me more, I said. She said, well, Brandon, you might not know it, but for a certain period of time, this was the particular text wheeled out in weddings for my generation. She said, we as women at least in my hometown, clung to this text because we were supposed to lose a certain part of who we are when we entered that sacred covenant of marriage. We said to our husbands, where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people. Your gods, my gods. I don't like that story, she said. I don't like that story at all. You see, that's the problem we often encounter, especially as a Christian community, and I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. When we do weddings, we pluck out these beautiful texts in language and place them in a sacred ceremony. We do it all the time. For the past decade, I've read 1 Corinthians 13, <laughs> countless times in a wedding. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, boastful, arrogant, or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. You see, I can say it word for word. And we do that from time to time. That's a good verse. And we pluck it in the middle of a sacred ceremony, removing it from the complexity of its history, of its theological significance, and then unfortunately, from time to time, we place it on the lives of vulnerable communities and do great damage. Now, I don't want to minimize the power of this text if you have used it in the past for a sacred ceremony. But instead, I want us to step back for a minute and put Ruth and Naomi in their historical and political context and see what is really going on there. And then for a minute, begin to learn from the power of our ancestors, our movement ancestors, our ancestors that strove to create community. Because rather than, I think, interpreting this story as one of giving up one's identity, it can be one that shows radical solidarity among women who are most vulnerable. It can be one that teaches us about what it means to be a community of faith, 
centered around acts of love, solidarity, and justice in this world. Rather than giving up identity, it's about standing up, standing for, and standing with one another. So who are Ruth and Naomi? These seemingly audacious, resilient women. Well, this particular story was written sometime between the 4th and 6th century BCE. And I don't have to tell you, you don't have to be biblical scholars to know what it meant to be a woman at that time and place. And we figure it out quite quickly in the text that Lowell read so wonderfully this morning, is that one's identity, livelihood, and very self-worth was wrapped up in one's ability to be and stay married. That when a woman was wedded to a man, they were protected, cared for, when they lost that in the ancient world, they were most vulnerable. Their seeming worth had fallen away. Their ability to even get the basics, food, water, shelter, was tenuous at best. Especially, and we even see it in the text this morning, if their families rejected them. That is the social political context into which Ruth and Naomi found themselves most vulnerable, most hurt, most isolated. And Naomi did the thing that any good mother-in-law would do, go home, save yourselves in essence, simplify it. She says, I hope your people will accept you back because I don't see where we can turn anymore. My womb is dry. There are no more men to be married. And then the text takes a turn. And Ruth, in her pluckiness, in her ancestral way, says, where you go, I'll be right beside you. Wherever you land, I will be with you as well. Your faith is my faith. Where you go, I will go. Your people are my people. And together, Ruth and Naomi then traversed a very complicated world. If you haven't read the book of Ruth, I encourage you to do so. And if you don't have the time to open a Bible, simply Wikipedia it, and you will find the details. Ruth and Naomi's story is complex at best. They are cunning, resilient, strategic women that found themselves in a complicated world. But when you step through that complexity, the decisions they were forced to make, what you begin to find and emerge is a radical sense of solidarity and support in this world. Ruth and Naomi were there for one another. You can extend beyond those verses and begin to also hear, your hopes will be my hopes. Your dreams will be my dreams. Your struggles will be my struggles. Your pain will be my pain. Your loneliness will be our community. And that family of God, I believe, is the teaching of our ancestors, Ruth and Naomi. Is that in their formation of radical solidarity and support is what we are called to be about as a community of faith and as a people of faith. Now, we've been using Shonda Jha's book, Rebels, Despots, and Saints. And I use her chapter on movement ancestors, which is far into the book. I encourage you to read it if you've got time. But in essence, Shonda Jha invites us to look at our movement ancestors, those who've started or continued movements of social justice and change in this world, those who've embodied love and justice in words and actions. In our almost immediate history, we think about Fannie Lou Hammer, 
who worked for civil rights and women's rights. Martin Luther King Jr., who spoke words of hope and justice into this world. Cesar Chavez, who worked on behalf of workers in the fields. Those are our movement ancestors, as Shonda Ja explains. But she also explains in that chapter, we've gotten ourselves into a tricky position. She doesn't use the word, but I'll use it. And it's a strand in Christianity called perfectionism. Is that we expect our leaders to be perfect, to be ideal. And when we look at our movement ancestors and we find that one weakness, we poke at it. We downgrade their significance. Shana Ja explains that. And she talks about social justice movements and movements for love today, that when she talks to those leaders, they say, we set a high standard for ourselves. We are often very hard on who we are as people that advocate for change. If we don't do this, we're not enough. If we don't speak the right word here, we're not enough. If our movement ancestors made a mistake or two, strip them from their significance. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't hold our leaders accountable for a myriad of systems that they didn't stand up against. But what I'm saying is we need to continue to dust off the stories of our movement ancestors and find out and rediscover what they can teach us. If we have put them in a back closet because they embarrass us, pull them back out. If it's because they did something in their private and personal lives that causes us to blush on our face, don't dismiss it, but understand them as fully human people of faith, just as we all are, and begin to learn from the complexity of who they are and what they can teach us. I don't like the story of Ruth and Naomi, she said that afternoon. It's been misused time and again as so many of our sacred stories have. Our sacred texts have done undeniable damage to the most vulnerable of our world. They've left some of us with pretty deep scars, both literal and metaphorical. But our invitation as we study the story of our ancestors is to dust them off a little bit, put them in their social historical context and to maybe find out what they meant at that time and rediscover what they can teach us. And so I turn back to Ruth and Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your people, they'll be mine. Your children, I will love. The complexity of your life, I will embrace. And thus comes the teaching for us as a community of faith. When we join this space and when we join this endeavor, whether it's here in person or online, we're saying just that. You're not going to get rid of me. Where you go, I'm going to be there. When you hurt on a Sunday morning because the week has bruised you, I'll sit next to you and pray with you. When you have a dream of this world that we don't think can be realized, I'll dream with you. When your body aches just sitting down in a pew, I'll sit next to you because I love you regardless of who you are. When your family breaks your heart, we'll be your family. When you're exhausted because of work, life, and realities of this world, I'll be exhausted with you. Ruth and Naomi taught us amazing things about solidarity, love, hope, and community in this world. In the tradition of those movement ancestors, I invite you to think about others who have taught you the same. 
They're in abundance around us. I name just a few. Cesar Chavez, Fannie Lou Hammer, Martin Luther King Jr. I invite you as Marina plays the instrumental music now to think about those movement ancestors, those ancestors that taught us and you about community. Pull them out of the closet. Dust them off. Lay, lay their humanity bare in all of their complexity. Learn from them. Rehearse their names. Now, in a few moments, sit with their names, our ancestors, our movement ancestors, and give thanks for their complexity, for their love, and for their justice. I've been very blessed to have such a loving family growing up. As most of you know, my mother and father were both very active in this church. And they made all of their children, uh, made sure that all their children had strong role models to help nurture our upbringing. And I've always considered the members of First Christian Church Burbank my extended family. So in that sense, I've had many other mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfather figures because of this church family. Throughout this coming year, upcoming year, as I'm an elder up here, I'm going to highlight a few of the memories that I have of relatives that have helped shape my life and the life of this church as well. They might be just names to you, but they help lay the foundation of where we are in this church today. One of those names is Ray Shorb. Now, Ray Shorb was an established elder here and soon to be a, an elder emeritus. When I was first called to be an elder, I believe I was about 26 years old and he was in his early 80s. To say I was intimidated by him would be an understatement. He was so versed in scripture, biblical, and church history. Ray Shorb was also well known for making prayers last nearly as long as the minister's sermon. <laughs> but in my mind, he set a very high standard for what it took to be an elder. Now, we used to have two elders serving up here at the communion table. One would do the offertory meditation, won the communion meditation. And I remember one of my first times serving as an elder, serving with Roy, uh, Ray Shorb. He pulled me aside out in the North X, and he knew I was nervous. And he said, share with the congregation in your own style and your own language. Be honest and be yourself. I don't think his words helped me all that much that Sunday when I served with them. It's a blur. Maybe I've just blocked it out. 
But ever since then, I've tried to do just that in my meditations and in my prayers, to share with the church family the challenges that I am confronted with while on my, on my spiritual journey. I actually often think of Ray, Ray Shorb when I'm up here, especially when someone goes on a bit too long, <laughs> like I am right now. <laughs> However, because of Ray Shorb and Naomi and Ruth and so many other church ancestors, we are here today in this church sanctuary at this communion table, sharing this meal together. Long-winded or short, biblically versed or not, all are welcome here. In a few moments, I will share the words of institution. You were then invited to either remain in your seat and take one of those all-in-one communion cups if you're more comfortable with that space, or you're invited to come down the center aisle, take a piece of bread, and then take a cup and to return to the seat with you. We will then be led in the Lord's Prayer and we'll take the cup together. But however you come forward, whatever this meal means to you, just as Dave said, you are welcome here. So it was on that night that Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In a similar way, he took a cup and after giving thanks, poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant given for you and for all. Each time you do this, do this in memory of me.
While Rosie makes her way to lead us in the Lord's Prayer, a reminder about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the elders months ago decided to alter the language of the Lord's Prayer, and you'll see that. But with that invitation comes the reminder that the elders also decided that if that language isn't comfortable to you, certainly use different imagery or language. Or if you don't speak English, or e English isn't the language you're most comfortable with, speak it in whatever language you find hospitable, whether that's Armenian, Korean, or Spanish. But know that however you say the Lord's Prayer, whatever language you use, whatever imagery you use, you are welcome in this space of prayer. Padre nuestro, Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre, venga a nosotros tu reino, hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo, danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día y perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en tentación. Líbranos del mal. Amén. Tuyo es el poder y la gloria por siempre, Señor. Amén. Very tasty bread. <laughs> Thank you, Marina, for providing the bread today. And now we've come to this time in our service in which we share the announcements, all those things happening in our community of faith. <clears throat> we've got a couple of things going on in the com coming weeks. One involves next Sunday. Rosie is helping us in this series of ancestors to help us celebrate and build an altar around Dias de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, and she's going to come up in a few moments and explain how you can participate in the building of that altar, and next Sunday she'll also explain more about the cultural significance of that and what that means in this space. Rosie? Thank you. Okay. Um, the Day of the Dead, or Dia de Muertos, I think that's the name for everyone too, Dia de Muertos, okay. Um, it's an indigenous practice, so um, occurs in a different way than how we practice it today. We celebrate it before the Spanish invasion. So the Day of the Day celebration lasts for about a year, starting immediately after the person's death. So during the next year, <coughs> I'm sorry, the bread is good. <laughs> During that year, offerings were made with food. About Mexican people, it's always food. <laughs> Objects that belong to the deceased in life and could serve to the person of the way to Mictlan. Uh, Mictlan is the name of the place where souls reach their eternal rest. With the invasion, um, the teaching well, with the invasion and violent teaching, teaching of external customs, uh, the celebration of uh, Dia de Todos los Santos, is All Saints Day, was uh, introduced to the indigenous. So with the passing of the years and the attempt to live the freedom that our ancestors gave us, the day of the day uh, became a recovery of our roots or customs and a tribute of, uh, and gratitude to our ancestors. Explaining each indigenous practice and belief is long. I would love to be this long. <laughs> um, so um, I couldn't explain them without first uh, recounting my history and my culture. That's wonderful, but long. We don't have enough TV time for, to do that today. <laughs> so thank you, Brandon, for creating this family that we are all part. 
uh, and giving us to the Hispanic part of our community is Lee's family and, and my family. Uh, the opportunity to share with all of you just a little bit of Mexican indigenous history and culture. And I invite you to bring or send the uh, pictures, the photographs of the loved ones you want to invite to eat Mexican food. That's good. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> um, if you want to bring something to offer to your loved ones, you are totally invited. I'm pretty sure my grandmothers want to try any other food. <laughs> it's food. <laughs> um, if you want to share something that you shared with your loved ones, please do it. Um, I think it will be beautiful to get to know your loved ones uh, throughout your anecdotes. If you, can, if you can't bring food, just don't worry. We, we, we got you. <laughs> um, this is a party. This is a party, totally a party. So our, our ancestors will invite your family to eat and drink at this Mexican party. And yes, this includes mezcal and tequila and music <laughs> and flowers and candles <laughs> and decorations. So this is a party and everyone uh, is invited. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. So next, next week, or during this week, simply as she explained, br bring pictures of your loved ones. We will be building that. And then during that week of, of um, October 29th and the following days, our sanctuary will be open under the guidance of the elders, especially on November 1st and 2nd, so those who find that meaningful. So again, next Sunday, that building of the altar will kind of begin. If you have any questions about any of that, let me know. And traditionally, what we've done in this, traditionally, in the past couple of years, what we've done in this church for All Saints Sunday is write names on the sidewalk for those we know and love. So that tradition will continue with this as well. And as Rosie explained, it's going to be a good party and a celebration for what that is. So certainly send in your pictures or come ready to celebrate. A few of our other announcements, um, and the, another one is coming up next Saturday, October 28th from 4 to 8 p.m. It's our fall festival, and you're invited to wear costumes. We're going to have a bouncy house. We're going to have several stations. Dave Boatman's going to draw caricatures. We're going to have food made by Homemade Thursdays. Again, an opportunity to celebrate. And I have a task for you online. Post that information if you can. Send it to family and friends. If you're here in person, I have postcards for you to help me distribute. So find me after worship, and I'll give you a couple to give to family and friends or to distribute in your neighborhood. Also, immediately following worship today, I will be doing a presentation on my trip to Afghanistan and Pakistan. For those online, I'm going to share some stories and information that can't go out on social media to protect our global partners in Afghanistan. So there will be another opportunity on Zoom for our virtual members or those who aren't present to join me. But again, um, join us in the Upper Fellowship Hall where Donna Connolly is hosting Coffee and Conversation. There will be a presentation and an opportunity for you to ask questions. Now, with those two announcements, I also remind you that our weekly and monthly activities continue with a few adjustments time to time on availability. Nearly every Wednesday is our weekly study group. Um, readings are available, and at the beginning of November, we will start our study of uh, the book Rebels, Despots, and States, Saints on that Wednesday evening. And then on November 8th, author Shonda Ja will join us for a question and answer conversation all of that will be available via email. Thursday evenings continue every week with a weekly check-in uh, on Thursday evenings from 5 to 7 p.m. on Zoom. And then Homemade Thursdays is taking this week off, but every Thursday they utilize our kitchen to cook food for those living in the encampments. If you want to volunteer for that, uh, search me out and find out more information. We have a number of monthly activities that also continue. Be be BTAC lunch packing on the first Saturday of the month in the Upper Fellowship Hall. The Queer Fellowship Club meets the second Sunday of the month. And usually the Holistic Hikers meets the third, the third Saturday of the month. We took yesterday off because some of us were down in Tijuana with Project Mercy. Now, there are also opportunities to sign up for coffee and conversation out in the narthex 
As I said, Donna Conley is hosting it in the Upper Fellowship Hall today. But know that that's a great time to stand around, have conversation with one another, get to know each other, but we're always looking for more hosts. Now with that all being said, you're like, I didn't take notes on all of that. It will all be available in our weekly email that goes out most Tuesdays. Um, if you're not on that list, reach out to me after worship and I'll make sure to get you on that list. Now, with all that's going on, all that's happened in our lives, and all that's coming up, let us stand with the affirmation that God loves us, stand as you are able, and join Zach in song. When anger fills your heart, when in your pain and hurt, you find the strength to stop. You bless instead of curse When doubting floods your soul Though all things feel unjust You open up your heart You find a way to trust Well that's a little stone That's a little mortar That's a little seed A little water in the hearts Of the sons and daughters This kingdom's coming As you protect your own You still extend your hand You open up your home When sorrow fills your life When in your grief and pain You choose again to rise You choose to bless the name Well that's a little stone That's a little mortar That's a little sea That's a little water In the hearts of all God's children This kingdom's coming that's a little stone, that's a little mortar, that's a little seed, that's a little water in the hearts of the all God's children. This kingdom's coming. In the little, sorry, here we go. In the mundane task of living. Pouring out and the giving In the waking up and trying In the laying down and dying Well that's a little stone, that's a little mortar That's a little sea, that's a little water In the hearts of all God's children This kingdom's coming, that's a little stone that's a little mortar, that's a little sea, that's a little water, and our home gets a little broader. This kingdom's coming. Family of God, go out in the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Honor all creation. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with each and every one of us. Let us go in peace. Amen.